How y'all doing? Oh, come on, it's lame. How y'all doing? Come on, it's springtime. We all survived Derby. Everyone's somewhat vertical. It's good to see. Um, I'll start off with the truth. My truths and my stories, I've always worked in parks, and my first job was as a National Park Service ranger. And the best thing about being a ranger are the questions you get from visitors. And I'm now going to share my most creative question I ever got from a visitor. I worked at a national battlefield, and the visitor came up and said, I have a dumb question. And what do we always say when we hear that? <laughs> and then you just, you know, you just grab, oh, oh, here it comes. The visitor asked me with a straight face, why were all battles fought in national parks? <laughs> Honest question. <laughs> Let that one rack around your brain for a while. I'll do a presentation on the failure of the American education system following this. Um, so let's jump in. All right, y'all expect me to do this today. And, and, and this is easy and this is fun and I'm gonna do a little bit of it but that's not what we're going to do. My only prayer is at the end of the day, you don't think this guy talked to you, okay? So we're all over-caffeinated now. Um, I, I'm not going to do this. This is not what we talk about when we mean parks and the outdoors anymore. And dear Lord, help me, we're not doing this, okay? Let's just, we're all not trying to be Asheville. Just stop. It's great, great town, love it. Um, a lot of cool, cool things. But, um, what I am going to try to make the argument to you today, I hope persuasively, is that you live in a national park already. We just don't think of it that way. So the whole thing is a setup to get you thinking about where we live and what we do. And there'll be my personal midlife crisis story right in the middle. Um, we're going through the biggest transformation in the history of mankind as we speak, with more people moving to cities than ever before. You are living in a time of enormous change. Um, and it's just going to speed up, because this is our future. Um, and I know that there's a lot of discussion, and we all probably feel it, about missing a lot of small towns. I get it. Quick show of hands. How many of your great-grandparents grew up in what you would call the country? Look around the room. How many of your grandparents are from the country? How many of your parents are from the country? See how those hands dropped. How many of y'all are from the country? I mean, this, you guys are a perfect example of the reality we live in. So we're not going back, and I'm not going to bemoan it. Um, it is what it is. It's our job to deal with reality. And it's happening globally. Um, the big number that's jumping out is by 2050, seven out of 10 of us are going to live in cities. This is, this is our reality. This is our generation. This is what we're going to live through. So I want us to think about this and think about everything we do in terms of that urban construct. Um, and then, you know, where's the growth going? Where do we live? Well, the tendency when we mean urban is everyone thinks Manhattan. How many of y'all put Central Park, New York, or a New York City Park on your favorite park list? <laughs> yeah, hands always go up. That's fine. Now, I'm not picking on you. Well, I'll pick on you later. Um, but but um, the truth is, most of the growth is in medium-sized cities the size of Louisville. Um, this is the sweet spot globally for where this stuff is happening. And so I implore you to think about yourself as living at the cutting edge city. It always feels like San Francisco and Seattle, and I get it. Heck, I, it, it screw all y'all, I'm from Boise, okay? Why y'all got to rip on Boise earlier? Um, <laughs> really, killing me. Um, but, but, but think about yourself as a city. And then let's look at you know, how people move. This is what we were doing 15,000 years ago. Now, sidebar. Louisville, where you live right now, was New York City in North America 15,000 years ago. The story has been lost. This was the center of a huge, thriving culture. Um, and so we've always kind of been a city here. We've forgotten it. And this is our reality today. Um, this is how we communicated, you know, 150, 200 years ago. This is how evidently we communicate today. These are fundamental shifts. And our brains, for 100,000 years or more, have been evolved to be slower, we have evolved to be at a walking pace. This is actually hardwired into us, and how we turn that into a city lifestyle is gonna produce stress and tension, and that shouldn't be a surprise. And, and I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not gonna gloss over it, um, but this is real, y'all. Uh, cities are where we're gonna live, where we're gonna create, but there's a real cost to it. Cities erode well-being. Doing, living in a city does something to specific circuits of the brain that impairs our ability to deal with social stress. These are realities, and I don't want to do the heart-tugging thing, but I'm going to do it, so forget it. How many people in this room have felt lonely sometime in the last week? Yeah. That's not normal. Um, and we can do things, and we can attack this, and we need to think about it. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. 
um, because this is what city living looks like. <laughs> and and it's, it can be really stressful. So, um, you know, if I had done this talk to you all last year, you, you know, I probably would have gotten a lot, of, I probably would have spent 20 minutes on why living in nature is good. I'm sure you all read a lot and you've seen all the studies coming out probably over the last six months. It's really, it feels like a tsunami is hitting us of all the benefits of nature. And you all can read as well as I can up there. Um, but doing stuff outdoors, being in a green environment fundamentally makes us more creative. It makes us better people. This is not a value statement anymore. This is data, 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 data um, about it. And so, you know, we believe that green space, and I think we know it, and the science backs it up, that it's good. And if you want more information on it, you know, just search time outdoors in relationship to creativity. Go for a hike and see how you feel. Um, this is not hard stuff. And if you want a great, great, great book to share with your team and to focus on as part of your team in terms of creativity, I cannot uh, recommend Florence Williams' books, The Nature Fix, any stronger. Phenomenal read. Easy read. And for your team, just a great opportunity. So. Um, the argument I'm making, of course, is that if you care about cities at all and the health of people in them, nature is a need to have, not a nice to have. Um, this is, we're not playing a small ball anymore. The other interesting thing, um, on the business side, look, money being spent now in terms of stuff is moving to experiences. The amount of consumable goods people want to buy is not growing at the rate of what I want to experience. And I want you to think about what that means within a five-minute walk of your house. Um, and how that relates to the argument as well. So, you know, nature's good, yay, let's, let's go get some nature now. We're gonna, we're gonna load up the Griswold family vehicle and we're gonna go do this. So where do we go to do nature? Well, we go to the special places in the world. We all go to Barnes and Noble, we get the Lonely Planet book and then we just drool for a couple weeks and we plan these things. And, and this is where we go, so uh, let's all breathe and let's take a little trip. Ooh, wow, yeah, that's pretty chill. That's pretty impressive. That's how I feel out there. Or you're catching bonefish. And at the end of the day, you feel something like that. And we think, wow, my life has changed. How many of us have taken that trip where, oh, life has changed? So I'm gonna quit my job and do van life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's gonna be awesome. Um, and there are a lot of people doing it. You know, the outdoor rec industry is massive. $702 billion, man, this is massive. Um, let's put that into scale. Our entire nation's financial service and in insurance industry is $912 billion. That, to me, is a stand back. You know, oh my gosh, this is a big industry. But there's a problem. There's a big problem, is we have real world problems that take us away from this. We can't live the outside magazine life, and that's a fantasy anyhow. Um, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources, and sometimes we just don't have the motivation to get out and do this stuff. Um, and most of us tend to think we live far away from nature, particularly in cities. So these bright lights are where we all live. And the result is that we blow our vacation time. Look at this. This is the amount of vacation time that's turned back at the end of each year. And for everyone that thinks California and the West Coast, man, they just have the balance of life, right? Notice they have the highest rate of turn back. So nanner, nanner, nanner. You know, you have great weather, but me. Now, the good news is there's an answer to this. And the answer was created a few hundred years, about 120, 140 years ago. That guy, Frederick Law Olmsted, who everyone knows if you live in Louisville, which is, this is the best city to be a park guy in, because, like, I can say Olmsted, and I'm not looked at, like, weird, and people are actually interested. So, um, you know, he created our park systems. He defined the urban park and what it means to be a green city. Phenomenal. And you all can read that quote. But the deal is... Everyone can't afford to go to the Adirondacks. I'm gonna bring the Adirondacks to them. And he did it. And for 100 years, we've done it. We built some great parks. Someone named that park. Central Park. How about that one? Central Park. Look, it's the same park and people are using it. It's amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. How about that park? That's Brooklyn Bridge Park. If you haven't been to that son of a gun, oh, it's awesome. How about that one? Millennium, another great park, right? How about this one? Golden Gate Park in San Francisco because they had to keep up with New York. Look, it's the same damn shape as Central Park. I mean, <laughs> someone creatively lost track. And we've done it here. And we've done some wonderfully beautiful projects here. How about this? There you go, Beckley Creek Park in the parklands of Floyd's Fork. How about this one? There you go. So we have great partnerships. Look at all the organizations in our community that are doing park and parky-like stuff. It's 
awesome, right? Just awesome. It's really impressive for a city of 1.2 million people to have this many folks working at this. And then, of course, we have the city of Louisville, which has said about, oh, 10 years ago, we're going to be the city of parks. Wah, wah. I mean, what, what are we doing? So, look, here's the midlife crisis of Scott. I've done this 25 years now, across the nation. And you can't help but get disappointed. We built some great things, right? We all sat there and went, yeah, the Parklands, woo! And yeah, well, is it really good? We're getting sicker, physically and emotionally. Our lifespans may actually drop from this generation to the next. They're shortening. Did you guys see the, the report by the UN earlier this week on extinction? A million species extinct in the next 50 years? We had 4,000 acres of parks in Louisville and we drop in the Trust for Public Lands ranking. And that study's gonna come out next month and get ready, the media's gonna do the normal routine of we suck and just, but there are challenges. We have bad air. We do. And then rain bombs. This rain bomb thing is just unbelievable to me. I, every time it storms now, it feels like we get three inches of rain. Whatever happened to a shower? I mean, it just, it's remarkable. The tree stats, we're losing tree cover at a, just a phenomenal rate. And we know better. We know better. This isn't new. And then budget cuts. What's the first freaking cut? It's always parks. I don't care if it's a Republican, a Democrat, a Sierra Club member, a Tea Party member. The first thing whacked. First thing out of the box. Boom. Pools. I, I think some folks from Olmsted are here today. They're raising money to surface a freaking tennis court. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, wah. And then the lack of any response to climate change. Scary stat. And I don't care. I, I, I'm agnostic about your political beliefs on what causes it. It's happening. This is the most terrifying map to me that we're not talking about in Louisville. This is the projection of water in our community in the next 50 years. Spoiler alert, 30% more water in the Ohio River in 50 years. 30% more. And we just built a soccer stadium on the wet side of the levee. It's almost like we're saying, hey, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah, whatever. We're going to be the last city that builds an interstate on its river, a, 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 a new mall, and soccer stadium in a wetland. I mean, I, I don't get it. So we, and, and then the most terrifying thing, if you're paying attention, is that purple blob. That purple blob happens to be where most mountaintop removal happened. And they're talking about getting six more inches of rain a year there. We're talking about whole mountain failures, kids. And I'm not trying to be doomsayer, but this stuff can get you down. It gets me down. Because this is our moment. We only get one moment. This is it. We don't get do-overs. I'm 45, this is it, this is when you have to make change. So I'm wah, 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 you know, pouting, and, and, and it just makes you do a little bit of this. And you're like, what are, we, what are we doing here? And then I met a dude who made me wake up. And if I leave you with nothing else today, follow this guy immediately. His name's Dan, he's a National Geographic Explorer, and he's introduced a very interesting concept, I think, globally. And he's runs with a guy named Sir David Attenborough. You know David Attenborough, he's the best voice ever. It's, here is the koala bear, you know. <laughs> but he has a provocative thought, and the thought is this. Urban life is not worthless, and urban wildlife is not worthless. People deserve great habitats. Cities can be enjoyable. Cities are functioning ecosystems. People have power in cities in a way they don't have power elsewhere. And nature makes us better people. Pretty simple stuff, but let's chase this a little bit if you don't mind. The idea is that we declare our cities national parks and we represent and recognize that Homo sapiens is part of that ecosystem. You and I are animals. We are part of a functioning ecosystem. And if we act and focus ourselves on what it means to be part of that ecosystem, even in the concrete jungle, we reorient life. So next month, London is going to be declared the first national park city in the globe. Watch this story. This is a pivotal moment because we're starting to see ourselves as part of a system rather than separate from a system.
And we're starting to see wildlife as our neighbors and something we own something to in cities and we just don't go visit. That's a horrible photo. <laughs> but you shoot a peregrine falcon staying on a telephone pole, so. <laughs> this is just an example. If you want to have fun, Google rewild my street. You can create habitat in your yard, your deck, in ways with just little moves, little subtle moves. You create opportunities for wildlife. We can do it even bigger. We take power line corridors and we turn them into wildlife corridors. We reorient them. Sure, you got to grow a farm here. This is a new rooftop farm in Melbourne that opened last week. Rooftop farm serves the restaurant below it. it takes green roofs and goes pow. We know we lose jungles. What if we reinstitute jungles in our downtown with green buildings? We know we lose forest. What if we actually have a forest tree campaign? What if we actually create canopy forests? We know our roads block wildlife. What if we actually build pathways for wildlife to deal with roads? These are all very straightforward known facts that are not controversial. It's a question of what we want to do. So you're like, you're a liar now. All this stuff looks like Asheville. OK. <laughs> Get it. Yeah, it's fine. Fine, that's true. Whatever. Um, but it's not. It, it can be Louisville. It absolutely can be Louisville. So I, I asked the crack GIS analyst from um, Louisville, I said, look, let's map out some stuff so I can show these smart creative types, you know, where stuff goes. So let's do some data. So they said, I said, let's map out wildlife habitat. And the, these colors show where, you know, public lands are. And I said, well, that's where our wildlife is, right? And then they, the crack team spent eight weeks at work. They analyzed every uh, type of biological critter we have here in the community. And they developed the next map, which is the most work that's ever been done on wildlife habitat in Louisville. <laughs> I'm, I'm as blown away as you are. I mean, just staggering staggering amount of research here. But it's true. Look, oh, that's a horrible photo. Have any of y'all noticed a smell like really flowery the last couple of days if you walked around? That's black locusts. Black locusts are now flowering. They're native here. And the pear, we don't talk about pears. We're just, we're, we're, we're kind of bad that way. But yeah, pears will stink. Locusts will smell good. So if you're outside today, there's some around, um, look up and smell. And then what's remarkable is we have more diversity in Louisville than just about the entire state of Nevada, and certainly more than Utah, in Louisville. The tendency is to think everything's out west. Well, that's horse crap. We have more diversity back here. We just tend to, it's so green and so lush, it's just like a wave, we can't see through it. So, guess what calls Louisville home? That's here now, it's a scarlet tanager. That's here now, indigo bunting. That's here now, Baltimore Oriole. Those guys are here right now, a wood duck and a kingfisher. The new bullet trains in China, their front end is designed after the beak of a kingfisher. The creatives figured out nature solved it first and have deployed it technologically. Rose-chested gross beaks, they're here now. Kestrels, here now. Spotted salamanders, here now. Paddlefish, that's in the Ohio River two weeks ago, here now. River otters, I told Tyler, who's on my board, we saw one last night in our project site, which is a dump, a literal dump. <laughs> They're here. You're sharing land with a coyote. Here, now, not going anywhere. Rainbow darters, here now, only in the drainage of the Ohio River in the central area. That's your native fish in every creek that's worth a darn, including bear grass. Bats at night, how many of y'all go out at night and see them starting to circle around? It's unique, strange. Awesome, we're blessed. Tree squirrels cannot wait for the next couple weeks when it rains at night, go outside and listen to them. It's awesome. Flying squirrels, here now. You have them. They're hard as crap to see, but they're here. <laughs> now let's get freaky. Bobcats, here in Louisville, now. Bobcats. <laughs> it's okay. And guess what visited us last week? Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to keep coming because their numbers in the Appalachians are coming back and they get pushed out and they have to spread out. We have to make room for this stuff. This isn't a problem. It was so funny. I don't know if y'all remember. I'm a dork. Like the bear got to Indiana and they literally went five alarm APB on like this bear. <laughs> and they couldn't find it. It's so awesome. It's like, catch a freaking bear. I'm going to catch a bear. Good grief. All right, so you're like, well, fine, Martin, that's great. We have critters. You made your point. I get it, yada, yada, yada. But, but do we have adventure? So I put the crack GIS team to work again. I said, this, 
Guys, they're going to they're screw me over and say, we don't have any outdoor adventure. We live in flatland, blah, 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 blah. All right. So again, we, we put them to work. This was three weeks of work now to map the outdoor recreation resources in Louisville. And again, <laughs> I mean, I'm blown away. I don't know about you all. That, the amount of data to populate this is just remarkable. Um, so you typically think you have to go places like this to do climbing or, or you know, crazy stuff. I don't do that, but that looks like fun. But you don't have to. <coughs> you can climb urbanly. This is a building in London that they are going to turn into a 30-story climbing facility. I know. Stay with me. You're creative. If you don't feel creative at about the 22nd floor, <laughs> you're never going to feel creative. Okay? We typically think you got to go, you know, out to the mountains, the Gauley or the New River to go rafting. No. That's the falls of the Ohio right here. We are one of two cities in the U.S. with class four whitewater. It's us in Richmond, Virginia. There ain't nobody else. How about mountain biking? Yeah, we'd love to go out and do it in the Valley of the Gods. That'd be awesome. But you can do it in a city. And then what if we had an urban mountain bike trail through our alleys and through our downtown section? Kimba's all over it. And then we all love hiking. And it is great to go hiking. I love it. But we don't have much time, but what if we turned into urban hikers? Who says we just have to hike in the mountains? It's about us. This, these are values we carry. This isn't something out there. Um, so we believe at the end of the day, you know, preservation of urban living requires the preservation of wild things, wild experiences, and wild places. We no longer escape to nature. Maybe we reinvent it and we see ourselves as part of nature where it is, which is everywhere we are, and we're a part of the system. And when you walk out of that sidewalk today, instead of keeping your head down or on the device, you look up at a tree. You take two seconds and see if you can spot an indigo bunting. It changes how your brain is wired. The data is there. So if the whole park is a city, that means what, what, what does that mean to you maybe? And these are questions, and I'm trying to be provocative. Well, you plant a container and you grow something. Suddenly, if I live in a national park, how I take care of my yard or my patio is a little different. What if I, you know, unplug in the city, get away from things? What if I just look up when I leave today? What if I forget the definition of I only go outside when it's nice? I mean, Cherokee Park is mobbed when it's 72 degrees and sunny. At last check, we live in Louisville. We have about six days of those a year, right? <laughs> there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad gear. And have the courage to maybe ponder and expect and demand good answers for some of this stuff. You know, what if Beargrass Creek was swimmable? That's not a crazy thought, people. That's not as crazy as, it, as you may think. What if you could see dark skies at night? What if we had a rule in the city where all the lights at 10 o'clock got either turned down or brought low so we could see the Milky Way? These are choices, very easy, low-hanging fruit choices that feel impossible, but they change our life. What if hearing wildlife was part of your nightly experience? I'm trying to tell you to listen. But after the rain tonight, if we get it, go out and hear the tree frogs and the mockingbirds. Mockingbirds are awesome. Yeah and seeing wildlife and engaging with it. What if you got out of your comfort zone? And we all know growth occurs only when we push out of our comfort zone. I know this whole room knows that. What if you pushed yourself out and maybe went kayaking on the Ohio or went for a hike on a trail that you weren't really familiar with, with friends? What would happen then? Just pondering. And then what if you put out a birdhouse? A simple, simple act. And you know what? What if a snake got into that birdhouse and ate the birds? We, well, how do we recoil? Don't we recoil? Oh, my gosh, that was horrible, right? So yesterday at my house, my wife and I are sitting there. We're cooking, blah, blah, blah. The, literally, this hawk swooped in, grabbed a dove, and kept going. I mean, like, bow! I was like, that was awesome. My wife's like, I don't want to see that ever again. We're never going to talk about this event. <laughs> it's all perception. It's all perception. And it expresses the wildness, the uncertainty, the randomness of our existence as human beings. And the intensity of this randomness in a city framework, how it reframes our thinking. So you've got all sorts of apps at your disposal to do this in ways that no one else has ever had before. And if you don't have these, you know, download them. They're free. These are all free apps. There's Merlin Bird, which is so cool because it has bird calls on it. So you can call in birds. Ethically, I'm confused, but... 
you can, I'm not saying you should. Um, it, it, all trails is your trail guide galore if you want to know where to hike and you feel like, I don't, I don't hike because I don't know where to go and I don't have 2% body fat and shop at Quest and Whole Foods, so eh, no. no, 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 get out, stop it, just stop it. And then American Whitewater, uh, the Elkhorn Creek right over the way, you can feel the power of moving water and nothing changes your thought about creativity and existence than dealing with reality in a rapid. And, and I can waste your time on why ozone rewires your brain and everything else. So, um, you know, I want you to think about your urban ecosystem. And my final story before I shut the heck up is a little guy I met, Herman, who's a friend of mine. This is Herman. He's the director of a park in Leon, Mexico. This is where he's located, great urban park. There's a photo of it. And uh, he, Herman sent me a photo of a bird this winter. This is, um, you guys know it as a house wren. This is, uh, he sent this to me in February, really cool. This is my backyard yesterday. We're connected. His urban habitat and our urban habitat are absolutely elemental to the survival of that critter who moves between us. And you don't have to go to the Smokies. You don't even have to go to Bernheim, which is wonderful. It's your own backyard, it's your own space. And I've spent a whole career building parks in these pods. And the ultimate answer is these pods, while wonderful, are not going to be enough to save us. What's enough to save us is when all that private land and all of us as individual actors take our ownership role in our little space and it comes together. And that's the thought on National Park City. Um, this is a great, I love Noelle's work. Um, I find her to be one of the most thoughtful writers out there today. Um, but it says stuff we intuitively know but sometimes forget to think about. Um, that we are a part of something much bigger than ourselves um, in our own little self-absorbed world. Uh, we're stewards. In my faith tradition, uh, we are called to be stewards. Um, and how seriously we take this responsibility is really up to all of us. So it's, it's no longer being a city with parks or a city of parks that counts. Um, I think it's being perhaps a national park city where we see the whole thing as a system. You all have been very, very patient. Thank you, Ben, for your time and the invitation. That's all I got.